but I was against them trading for Bradley Beal during the season. He's an excellent player because it would have prevented them from having maximum cap space this summer. And I get it. Everybody say, well, Magic never missed the playoffs. Well, Magic never played with less than three Hall of Famers. Because it's difficult. It's a mental drain to play these regular season games when you know it's all about May and June. Chris Broussard here, and welcome to the brand new Hoops on Fox podcast. This podcast will give you your daily dose of all things NBA from Fox Sports, including the best content from Skip and Shannon, Nick Wright, plus special guests, fresh NBA content from myself, post-game interviews from NBA stars around the league, and much, much more. Up first, Chris Broussard joins Nick and CeCe to explain who's really in control of the Lakers. Bouchard, do you think the Lakers gave LeBron too much control when putting this team together this offseason? We've been saying this all year that, you know, LeBron, when they met with Magic, LeBron was talking about what he wanted to be surrounded by. First, I think we have to understand Magic. Magic had a lot of say with the Lakers. He was had a really great relationship with the owner, Jerry Buss, to the point where some of his teammates were a little leery of it. Like, they saw, thought he was too close. You're talking about Magic when he was a player. When he was a player. Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, had a great relationship. We know he got Paul Westhead fired There's his second year. There's a great story year. about that, is that when somebody very close to the late Jerry Buss came to him and said, man, we got a huge problem. Right. Magic, you got a huge problem. <laughs> Magic said he doesn't like the coach. And the late Jerry Buss said, well, that's not a big problem at all. Let's get rid of the coach. We'll fire the coach. <laughs> right. And they fired the him the next day, day and gone. Pat Riley's there and showtime begins. But go yep, ahead. Yeah, but that that's magic, okay? So, And I think a superstar should have some say. So I don't mind sitting there listening to LeBron. And I get where LeBron was coming from, okay? We tried to outshoot the Warriors in Cleveland. We couldn't, Okay. When we beat them in 2016, we had, and even challenged them pretty well in 2015 without Kyrie and Kevin Love. We we had tough, right. We had tough, gritty defenders. Like you said, we mucked it up. We we need some playmakers too. I want some other guys that Mm -hmm. can make plays with me. So Magic should have taken that into consideration. And okay, we'll go get a few of those guys. But also get some shooting. They're not mutually exclusive. And that's the thing he didn't do. I would have loved for them to keep Brooke Brooke Lopez. Well, now that that looks like a disaster. Oh, my God. Can you imagine how good? I mean, they tried to get Brooke Lopez light in Mascala, and he's really light. I mean, we saw saw Channing Frye and the last eight legs of his career yep. mm-hmm. be good with LeBron, a stretch five. Brooke Lopez this year, now he wasn't as good of a shooter last year as it was, Dude, as it was this year. Really this year with Milwaukee, it's opened up something entirely. And Brooke Lopez was cheap. Right. It was three and a half million bucks. It, here's, here's the thing. I, we, to be fair on all sides of it, I clearly had underestimated how much influence LeBron had on the roster. Because I had been told very specifically, and I still believe, and I, and I almost know it to be true. LeBron did not present them, here are the names to go no, get. No, but what no. he did say, has, has now been reported r- repeatedly by you, Ramona Shelburne, and others, is the archetype of player. They then came up with a list of guys they think they could get that fit that archetype, and LeBron signed off. And there was only so many guys available, too. But that's the other element. Yeah, it wasn't like right? the, it was a great list. Right, right. It guys like a that ton you of can get cheaply there. on one-year right. deals. This Laker team would look very different if they weren't adamant about keeping max cap space. But I was against them trading for Bradley Beal during the season. He's an excellent player because it would have prevented them from having maximum cap space this summer. So when you are building a team that is not really for this year, it's to keep flexibility for next year, there are going to be some limitations. They still, everyone could have done a better job. And you could have recognized that, like, Beasley isn't a playmaker. He's not even right. right. They're, they're I don't know li- why they picked up Beasley. Right. Uh, it, everyone could have done a better job. The only thing that's really should be at dispute here is the choice of words. Did they give LeBron too much control? Because I believe that's the wrong word. They asked LeBron. They made suggestions to LeBron's as far as what do you think? As long as you've been playing in this league, matter of fact, we haven't been to the playoffs in five years. Right. So, I mean, what we're doing, it was like Nick Saban, he told me. When he got hired at the University of Alabama, he talked to the president, and the president told him what kind of football team he wanted on the, on the field. And Nick Saban said, I was, I was more than cordial. I allowed him to explain to me what kind of team he wanted. 
And then I went on to tell him <laughs> that I was making all the decisions and the type of team that he had won had gotten smashed. Right. <laughs> and, and they had taken the right. roll out of the tide. He had planned on bringing the roll back to the tide. So in doing that, I can understand. He's been to eight straight finals. Why wouldn't you ask right. him? Um, if I'm sitting outside and on, on on your front on oh. on on in, in the, on the street waiting for free agency, sitting in my car, what do you think? Once LeBron agrees to come, what else are you gonna talk to him about? Hey man, what style you want to play? Right. I mean, what what else are you gonna talk about? What kind of players, man? What kind of who do you like, man? Who do you think is underrated? Who are you familiar with? Who are you comfortable with? And the list that was presented to him was not a great list. So any superstar, we have seen it through the history of time. They always get blamed. If the coach gets fired, they get part of the blame. That's all part of being a superstar in the NBA. But I believe that they went about it the right way. They were just magic wasn't right. And LeBron wasn't right. But also, LeBron hasn't been the best at evaluating talent, seemingly. And he, he wanted Dwayne Wade there because they were friends. It didn't quite work out. We, we heard the rumors that he wanted Carmelo Anthony. That really wasn't going to work out. He doesn't have the best judgment in evaluating talent, whether he even should have playmakers or shooters. Chris Bouchard, I want you to make a list of guys who have been exceptional at the NBA. And they are good at talent evaluators. Because it's a small sheet of Jerry paper. West, Jerry West. That, 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 it might That's stop it. after I think that. it's him because Elgin Jordan Baylor was a GM trouble. for a long time, but he wasn't right. great at it. Right. I mean, if you Jordan hasn't been good at it. Magic hasn't been good at it. The, Kobe's not into the business, so we don't know. I listen. I listen to Shaq. Magic's and, early. I mean, it's one year, what one or two years. So, so may, maybe it's not yeah, fair yet but, on Magic. But, but certainly there's, Jordan and. LeBron. But it is Jerry West. See, you're. I That's mean, that is. That, okay. that is of all time great players. So for us to have those expectations from players. Now we should be able to take the knowledge that they do have. Because I know through Shaquille O'Neal when he was a teammate with LeBron. I was invited in Cleveland to, to a practice into a game. And I sat there in the stands. I was like, Shaq, give me some." He's like, man. Man, the dude is savant, man. The dude is savant, man. Know everything, every play. Every man i never seen nothing like in my life. I mean, that's from Shaquille O'Neal at a very young age. So, LeBron, we have to give him credit for who he is. Right. But in doing this and putting this team together, this it was limited who they could get. But, uh, this and is, the players they got were not – they didn't – it just didn't work out. And this is a theme across sports. Sometimes we, we off the air when we're talking about people to potentially bring on the show. It's like very recently retired football players. And we it's usually people you know better than we know, right? Because either relationships with them. And more often than not, your response is on a lot of these guys, man, that what are they going to talk about? Because they don't know the league the way we think they would know the league. Like guys that are contemporary players, even if you know what's going on in the league, the ability to evaluate who's good, who's not, versus who played well against you. Versus who had moments you against you. this mm -hmm. way as right. opposed to this right. way when you're in the league playing, and that's yes. your point. Which is why for the Lakers, and this is in the conversation I had yesterday with a Western Conference executive, his, no, not concerned, he's actually happy about this part of it, mm -hmm. is that the Lakers don't have the, what I would call, like the, the non-basketball smart guy. They don't have someone in the room in a real position of power that can say, all right, Here's actually what the metrics say. Here's what, no matter what you think about Lance Stevenson's being an irritant and toughness, his team over the last few years has been worse with him on the court than off the court, except for this year in Indiana. Like there, there's an element of Magic and Palenka kind of fit the same role. Like Magic and Palenka are both the relationship G side of the GM business, right? Like an agent and a player, but who's the guy that is scouting the next Luca? Who, you know what I mean? Right. Who's the guy that is figuring out what? Okay, w we don't have enough shooting. Like the, the Ingram and Kuzma top out here at shooting, and we can get cheap shooting this way rather than that way. Let me say this quickly too, because when LeBron, he's going to own the team. We know he's talked about that. He's not going to let a player run the organization. OK, and that's you as much say as you mm, may give a superstar mm. player, mm. the player can't run the organization. LeBron won his two types, two of his three titles in Miami where Pat Riley had control. LeBron Ooh. was a player. Now, I'll get some say from LeBron, as you said, but there has to be a hierarchy, a defined hierarchy in just about every organization. Yes. So that's important, too.
for the Lakers going forward. Next, Jim Jackson joins Colin Coward to explain how the summer now determines contenders in the NBA. This Warrior dynasty, though, they got polished by 33 at home. They've lo- they've been blown out by Boston, Philly, mm-hmm. Toronto, Milwaukee, all four Eastern teams at home. Let's take me back to the MJ dynasty. Were they this bad during the regular season regularly? No, I mean, they got beat. I remember when I was in New Jersey in 97, we beat them in Jersey, okay? And then we went back to Chicago and they got us. But they had some games like that, but it's a different time. You know, it's interesting because I did the game last night and uh, we were meeting with Steve Kerr. And leading up to it, he said the challenge for him is trying to figure out how to get his, how to motivate his guys on different levels because human nature sets in. Of course. And with the grind of the last five years, okay, how do you motivate a team that's kind of already been there? At first, the first two years, it was just, we're fun, we, we're going at it, we got something to prove. And then it switched to being more of a burden during the regular season. And that's what we saw last night. A Boston team trying to figure it out, we're on the road, can we bond together? This road trip is huge for us to kind of bond together where it was a Golden State team that came out flat and see kind of looked like, here we go. Body, body language, by the way, we'll show some video here, the body language for Golden State. Yeah, no. I mean, just not getting back. You know, I, I want to talk about the Kyrie situation mm-hmm. because we were, Joy and I were talking about this earlier, is that uh, I wrote both my books on a plane. Because I found that, that, that I tend to be kind of ADD mm-hmm. and I can't pay attention to stuff. But when I was on a plane for six hours, I, wow, yeah. I could dive deep. And Kyrie mentioned last night that the flight was so long that Danny and Brad called him up. Go back, go back to the bad times in your career yeah. and the flights. And how do you turn the chemistry around? Well, it depends on the team, too, and the makeup of the team. I think that's so important because you got to keep in mind, a lot like the Lakers, the young players, okay, there's a lot of commonality there because you had high expectations based off what happened last year. Kuzma, Ingram, Ball. Lonzo, yeah. Okay, you think about, okay, now they're going to take the next step. You think about Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, Rozier, after that great, great next step. Now you bring back Kyrie, you bring back LeBron. Oh, instantly we're going to get better. But what happens is you have these young guys that got expectations upon themselves on what they, who they want to be, and they're young. Kyrie hasn't had to deal with that in regards to being a leader. LeBron hasn't had to deal with that in regards to being a leader because he's had an older team put around him. So I'm, I'm sure on that flight, and they talked about this Boston after the Houston loss, about what they needed to do. Everybody's talking about toxic environment, this, this, and this. And, and we expect it just to all happen because, oh, they're, but they're young kids and Kyrie really hasn't led. So that flight probably gave them time to kind of talk a little bit more, to be in close comfort, to have some things out, to figure it out a little bit. And the difference last night was from the beginning of the game, they were connected. Oh, the bench, even the bench. Oh, the, they were cheering on everything. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, I watched the first half. They were so engaged. Oh, it was unbelievable to watch, and it was even better to watch them continue to go to Gordon Hayward. Yeah. See, listen, Colin, I've been in that situation to understand what Gordon Hayward is going to. My third year, when I got hurt, 51 games, I'm averaging 26. The next year I come back, I'm not the same player. Okay, Gordon Hayward didn't play as many games with that crew as I did with Dallas, but trying to integrate him back into the system caused a little problem. Trying to integrate me back in the system caused a little division because I wasn't the same player. And I can understand um, Brad's dilemma, the player's dilemma, and Gordon's dilemma, you know? And to see him play like, like that last night, would he get 30 every night? No. But to watch his teammates support him, when he was open, they made sure he got it. They were cheering on the sideline. That was a beautiful that, – that was one of those moments where you can see, okay, now where can this Boston team carry that attitude? Forget win or loss. 
it's how they played the game to me that was more important. Yeah, and they, and they, and they do have playoff experience, a great coach, and they got about seven, eight guys that can play. Al Horford, Gordon, Kyrie, Jason Tatum, right. Jalen Brown. Marcus Smart. Yeah, and, and the other kid, the, the four, Morris. Uh, Morris. Yep. About seven dudes that can play in this league, some B minus, some A minus, mm-hmm. but I, I still like them. I've said my championship bubble is Golden State's the only team in the bubble. Houston, Boston, Philly, I think, are really talented. Milwaukee is close. Right. Let's go to LeBron. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I said this. I said about after that last season, I said it and I readdressed it today. You could make an argument that LeBron would have been better off moving to L.A. L.A. is big. It engulfs you. Mm-hmm. If he just said, listen, man, I just got out of a bad marriage in Cleveland. I'm going to take a year off. It's not tampering when you're retired. He comes to L.A. It's like, you know what? I want to do some movies. I want to do some stuff. I want to two chains. I want to do my stuff. Right. When I moved to LA, I, I was at the beach for six weeks. Mm-hmm. I dyed my hair. Mm-hmm. I was a mess. Okay. <laughs> LA, LA does that to it you. It does. That LeBron may have been better served after eight straight trip to the finals, looking at it and saying, we, this is, this, you know what? I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to get off the treadmill. I'm going to survey all this stuff. I'm going to tamper, although it's not tampering. I'm going to get on my private jet. I'm going to go to warrior games. I'm going to take Clay and Kevin Durant out. Is I look at this year and I think, of course it didn't work. You can't get remarried 15 minutes into LA. He should. This, there's no way this emotionally was mm-hmm. gonna work. Well, well, here's the challenge too for a guy like LeBron because he's so competitive in what he wants to do. But because he's older in his career, and you understand that he's crossed over. You talk about the mogul stage to doing other things. To me, just outside looking in and what this team needed. Maybe you don't do all the Hollywood stuff. Maybe it's just basketball this year because that young team needed his full attention to understand what it means to win. And they didn't get it. And they didn't get it. And it's no fault of his own from this perspective because in his mind, he's still doing what LeBron does all the time. Everybody else just follows. But again, I'm going to go back to the youth aspect of it. When you got people saying – Okay, we need you to step up. You're next in line. Kyle, Kyle Kuzma, he's a surprise at the NBA. You know, what the Lakers were able to get in Ingram, you need to play better. All this stuff is going on, okay? Yeah, we want to win, but I need to get my numbers too. I need to get better. I need to prove as a young player that I can compete in this league. And, and, the, prop, and the issue we have is that we want an 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old to automatically be 25, okay, overnight. It doesn't happen. They got to go through a process. And the process could have been helped a little bit more by LeBron of that laser focus. Okay. And I hate to compare Kobe and LeBron, but imagine if Kobe was in the situation. It's all basketball. And that's what those young players would see. Oh, by the way, I never felt Kobe in all his years in LA. I never felt he was distracted. I felt Shaq was often distracted. Well, yeah. Shaq, Shaq was into the Hollywood thing. And, and again, different personalities, different upbringing. Think about when Kobe was going through the whole trial. He had some of his best games because he was labor, la- laser focused, okay? When I was there briefly with the Lakers, I got a chance to see it, okay, firsthand. Oh, just Kobe just being all about basketball. And that makes other guys that want to play and want to contribute – you know what, <laughs> you know, maybe tonight or maybe I, I got to really zone in because that guy up front, employee number tw- number eight at the time, um, is zoned in. And I got to do my job. And, and sometimes it takes that subtle change in the personality, as big as LeBron is, to say, you know, I'm just going to focus here. Uh, by the way, um, one question about Jordan. Uh, LeBron will surpass Jordan tonight mm-hmm. in points. Um I said, listen, I, I spent a lot of time saying LeBron's the Swiss Army knife of the NBA. Mm-hmm. He's, he does more things well than Michael. But I will tell you, I was at Michael's last game in Portland. Mm-hmm. We have video. He was 40. He went 11 of 19, 25 points, 7 assists. I was at that game about third row to the left. Right. I do not believe LeBron's 34, that in six years, LeBron will ever play an NBA game and easily be the best player on the floor. And by the way, Rashid was on the floor. Bonzi on the mm-hmm. floor. I think Rip Hamilton was on the floor. Damon Stoudemire was on the floor. Zach Randolph was on the floor. I was at that game. Portland was a 50-win team. Michael at 40 was unbelievable. Um, go to your last time playing Jordan. How mm-hmm. old was he? In Washington. When I played him in Washington. So, But here's the difference. His game was so dimensional from this perspective. 
Okay? If he, wasn't, if he didn't shoot the three well, guess what? I can go to the mid post. I can go to the post. I can go to the mid range. All the stuff that we're seeing right here are baskets that are in 15 feet, 18 feet, the post. All of those things are hard to stop. He can still get those shots. LeBron is built more, I'm going to take a long jump shot or I'm getting to the basket. Yeah. And then he's not shooting free throws well. So as you get older, it's easier to guard you. Okay? Because I can take that away. With this right here, this is a skill set that he developed over years. So when he got 40, this was second nature. LeBron doesn't have that tool in his toolbox to kind of go to mid-post, post, to be able to still be effective. Would he still be great? Eh, he probably will be. We don't know. But, but six that game right there. Transcends. Transcends. I don't care. That transcends. I, that game had Rip Hamilton, Zach Randolph, mm -hmm. Damon, Bonzi, Sheed, and I sat there with a buddy of mine, and I'm like, he is the best player on the floor. It's unbelievable. And, and 40. He, he 40 years old, but he did it because he was so efficient at understanding where the sweet spots in the defense were and where he could get his shots, okay? That's the beauty of it. And as great as LeBron is, that one year in, in Miami when he really went to the polls, he was right hand, left hand, could, couldn't stop him. I said, see, that's that next step. But he kind of went away from it because yeah. he's more comfortable playing outside. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, uh, Jim Jackson, 14 NBA seasons. Congratulations on all your personal stuff as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. Now, Steven Jackson sits with Skip and Shannon to explain why LeBron missing the playoffs doesn't tarnish his legacy. You first. How would missing the playoffs affect LeBron's legacy? It wouldn't affect it all to me. I mean, a little? No. Um, I love how... We do everything we possibly can to excuse Jordan not making the playoff in his final two years. And I get it. Everybody say, well, Magic never missed the playoffs. Well, Magic never played with less than three Hall of Famers. Bird never missed the playoffs. He never played with less than four Hall of Famers. Tell me the guy, tell me the guy on the roster currently that's going to be all NBA moving forward. Tell me the guy that's on the roster right now that's going to be in the Hall of Fame. And I'll just wait. Oh, yeah, that many. Not Look, I get it. On which roster? On the Lakers, Lakers roster. Right now? Right now. Rondo. Rondo, right. I was going to say Rondo. You think Rondo yeah. will go to the Hall of Fame? Possibly. Yeah. If you see the people, some people that's in the Hall of Fame, yeah. they definitely deserve it. <laughs> but when those guys were playing hey, with... Those kids, who knows what they might do. It's just the take, they might it's take early. off. Let me ask you a early. question. It's early. What can I do you? Where would you rank Kareem? If you, but if, what, what do you say, Kareem? You think Kareem is okay? Yeah. Kareem. You think Kareem Top okay? Three. Top three to me. Top three. Guess who? He, guess, guess, guess who? Guess who played? With, who he played with? Magic. So you can understand why they would make James Worthy. Is he in the Hall of Fame? Hmm. What about McAdoo? Hmm. What about Mikael? Parrish? Dennis Johnson? Bayless. Nate Archibald? Bayless. Bill Walton? Come on, Skip Bayless. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You, I didn't say a word yet. I haven't even spoken. <laughs> because the fact, you, because, can you name one player Michael played with at Washington? Exactly. No, not no, one. Not, not one. one. But I can name old Scotty Pippen and Dennis Rodman. You know Dennis Rodman led the league in rebounding all three years he was in Chicago? And your point is? The point is he had Hall of Famers. And okay. when he didn't have a Hall of Famer, guess where he was? He was 38 and 39. He had been off for three years. He'd been gone from basketball. And even at that, even at that age, he mm -hmm. still wasn't in year 16. That was year 13, year 14. Mm -hmm. LeBron James is in year 16 with eight straight finals on his resume, a sprinkle in a couple of Olympics, mm. and da da, here we are. Still mm. giving you mm. 27, 8, and 8. Can and I answer you? you know, I, I'm glad you yawned because those are roll out of bed numbers that was, for LeBron. Right. That's what he does. He just rolls, he yawns and rolls out of bed, and he goes 27, 8, and am 8. I su am I surprised they're not in the playoffs? I thought the Lakers would be better. I really That's thought nice. the Lakers would be better. But then the injury bug started. It hit him. It hit Rondo. It hit Lonzo. And now Kuzma. And now Ingram. And now Stevenson. And now mm -hmm. Chandler. So, yeah, come on. But when we look at a stack, this is not a really good team now. Not a good team at all. And, you know, people shouldn't be upset that they didn't make the playoffs. I mean, I think if anybody had a rude awakening, it's LeBron. Because everybody was telling him the Western Conference is a different monster. Mm -hmm. Now, experience is the best teacher, and right. he's saying it's a different monster. But at the same time, guys that know the game, we knew it was a possibility that they'll be in this situation, mm -hmm. you know, with the young team they right. have. But I'm going to say this, and I'm going to leave it alone. Keep that same energy because the Lakers won't be the same team next year. Mm. Okay. Keep it. So, does it taint his legacy that he missed Not the playoffs? At all. Well, obviously, Kobe did miss the playoffs the year after Shaq was run out of town by Kobe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let's look at Kobe's teammates. In that year, they missed the playoffs. They went uh, 34 and 48. Right. Mm -hmm. Not good. Right. Okay. Karan Butler was the second scorer. 
Lamar Odom was on that team, third score. You remember the immortal Chucky Atkins, Chris Mim, Jermaine Jones, Devin George. That's what you got to work with. Mm -hmm. Not a great team. Mm -hmm. A team that I would have looked at before the year and said, I don't know. That's that's in the West. They'll play hard, but yeah. I'm not sure about that. Then they bounced back, and they did make the playoffs the next two years, but they went out quickly and unceremoniously to the Phoenix Suns in the first round. You know, you better tell me Kobe lost in the first round. Yeah, and he had one pout game where he just he, he, we didn't shoot the ball. Yeah, people were all over him. He so he had too a lot. Much, so he said, Ah, today I'm not going to. So shoot. you know what, Stacks? He had a lot in common mm. with Michael Jordan because mm-hmm. you know Michael Jordan went out in the first round. Mm. He went out in the first round. Mm. Went the old bad, but big the big three. Wow, wow, get up out of here. <laughs> wow, wow, get up out of here. Are you talking about the same guy who went 6 and 0 in the finals with six MVPs? In the finals? I, hold on. He can't be. He can't uh, be. Oh, yes, I'm talking about uh, him. I'm guy? talking about the one that the bad boy Pistons. Uh. The bad boy Pistons had him at the crash. You know, had Scotty Pippen talking about he got a migraine, didn't want to see robbing him <laughs> on. Huh? I think they're turning down your lights. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're silencing you. Silencing you. Uh, silencing what God you. said, turn the lights off. <laughs> Talk about that, Skip. Yep. Talk about that. Oh, How the wow. bad boy Pistons yeah. put him on. His, put him over his knee for three years. Wop, wop, wop. Now come back next year with a little more firepower. Wop, wop, wop. Hmm. Interesting. Did it happen? You was covering the team. I want to know, Skip Bayless. Tell the truth now. So the only oh, way okay. this taints LeBron's legacy is it just completely undercuts and disqualifies your argument that he's greater than Michael Jordan. That's all it does. Because at age 34, which is LeBron's age right now, Michael Jordan won another scoring title and was first team all defense at age 34. And obviously they went on to win another championship, their sixth, and another finals MVP, his sixth. Skip, okay, we got to stop, Shannon, we stop. But here's the thing. That's 34 to 34. But here's the thing. He, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen led the team in assists all those years. Someone else led the team in rebounding all those years. Jordan didn't have to worry about all these other things that LeBron did. But I still want to know why. Washington, he went to the Wizards. Why does that not have an impact on his legacy? He was still Michael Jordan. That's what you tell me. He the GOAT. Now, the GOAT's supposed to drag anything. GOAT's eat anything. Mm. So why couldn't he get it there? But this old big horn sheep, watch what he be doing in year. In, in year. And think about it. Hold on, Skip. You keep telling me when he was in Washington, that was year 13 and 14. LeBron James is in year 16. Mm-hmm. LeBron James, year 13 and 14, age, NBA age, Finals. Okay. Age 38 and 39 in Washington. What got to do with anything if he's okay. the guy that you said he is? But what is what, what player that's the face of the league won MVP and defensive player? Mm. That ain't it. Do you know right. that's, But that's that's hard to do, Shannon. LeBron James should have won the deep. Well, should have won. Uh, he got to play defense, defense first. Oh. The year Marc Gasol won it, you know LeBron's supposed to have a goddamn award stacks, right? And no. Did LeBron Man. not bring this year upon himself? Because we still hear that he was the one who wanted playmakers, not shooters. I don't right? know what LeBron. LeBron right. out of his mind. Okay, he was out of his mind, but that's what he wanted. <laughs> he give him a Rondo, give him a Lance. No. Who else can make plays? Skip, I don't know. If you look at LeBron James' career, LeBron James. Yeah. Has really played with two pay playmakers. Mm-hmm. That's Kyrie Irving mm-hmm. and, and uh, Dwayne Wade. Mm-hmm. And even when he had those guys, what was he surrounded with? Shooters. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So now all of a sudden you're going to get year 16 and talk about you don't want shooters, you want playmakers? Okay. What, what, okay, where are they? Where are the playmakers? Okay. So, I don't know. They're, they're <laughs> he told me he wanted playmakers. Yeah. Michael Rondo Beasley's in China, I think, right? I talked Rondo to him Beasley. yesterday. Did oh, you yeah. really? Yeah, yeah. Is he all right? Yeah, he's doing good. Good. Doing good. Shout he's out to Michael good. Beasley. To Michael I love huh. Michael Beasley. I mean, what about okay. playmaker, Skip? Okay. So, a year ago, uh, not even a year ago, but in the offseason, LeBron had chances. He could have gone to Philly and joined forces with that team. Great things would have happened. He could have gone to Houston, joined forces with that team. Great things would have happened. Mm-hmm. He joined forces with Hollywood. He wanted Hollywood, and he got Hollywood. And, and I was shocked the day it happened because I said, he's going to do this without a, a bona fide second. co-star, yeah. like a yeah. second score? Sure. Like, really? You're going to do that? Mm-hmm. Well, I guess he's going to do that. And then he brought some of this on himself because, obviously, at the trade deadline, he and Rich Paul attempted to power play their way into Anthony Davis. And they were willing to trade all the kids, all the clean out the locker room, all the kids. Yeah. And, and it just detonated that locker room. It, it never they was the same. It. They couldn't yep. handle it. Yep. Following, JaVale McGee joins Christine Leahy to break down his unique journey in becoming an NBA champion. 
Welcome to Fair Game. I'm Christine Leahy, and my guest today was a two-time NBA champion with the Golden State Warriors, and is partly responsible for bringing back the fanny pack from the Los Angeles Lakers. JaVale McGee is here. I gotta say, I am shocked that you're not wearing a fanny pack. I don't know that I've seen you off the court without one. What is it you love so much about the fanny pack? First of all, to answer your statement, I'm not wearing my fanny pack because I left it in the car. That's oh, my bad. I have it. Okay. Um, Do you you want to go get it? or no, you guys? Okay. I think I'll be okay. Okay. There's a lot of father and son duos that have played in the NBA, the Berries, the Currys, the Waltons. You are the first NBA player whose mother played in the WNBA. And I love your story because I just have this image of you in a bassinet always surrounded by WNBA players with your mom. Do you still have lots of memories of those times when you were growing up like that? Um, yeah, I definitely have a lot of memories of, uh, I, of course, I don't have the memories of being in a stroller. I don't think anybody, anybody's memory <laughs> goes back that far. But I do have memories of when my mother was uh, playing for L.A., Sacramento, and when she was coaching for the Detroit Shot. What's that like, though, being surrounded by a bunch of female basketball players? You're asking a question from a person that wasn't surrounded by female basketball players. So as a person who was, I just thought that was normal. Do you ever play one-on-one -on -one with your I used to when I was younger. I couldn't beat her until I was like 14. No way. Yeah. You have it just in your genes, right? This basketball. And there's a story that your mom, she was in her early 20s when she got pregnant with you. And she actually had an appointment because she wasn't sure if she was going to go through with the pregnancy. Your dad wasn't in the picture. And then she heard a pastor speak and she canceled it. And then came you. What did she tell you about that decision and what she heard that day? Um, she just told me that it was God sent and heaven sent that I was supposed to be born. And she told me a story how I was like born with a basketball in my hand. But like it was like a ball in my hand when I was born. It was like, I don't know, the stuff that's in a woman's stomach when, they're born, when the baby's born. But I was just like, yeah, okay. But it might be true. Or she might just be making it up to make it sound good. But that's my mother. I love her. Did that affect you at all, hearing that? It was it's a pretty crazy story. Uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, I didn't hear it and it was like, oh man, I must be destined to play basketball. I didn't take it like that. I was just like, oh, that's a cool story. But now that I'm older, I'm like, wow, and I'm actually in the NBA. I'm actually doing great things in the NBA. It's kind of a cool story now. But when, it, when I heard it, no, it wasn't really interesting to me. What's the best piece of advice she's ever given you? She's always told me like, it doesn't matter if you lose, win, fail or whatever, as long as in the end of it, you were like, I tried my hardest, like I worked my hardest. I was in the gym, I was in the weight room, I was working my hardest, so you can't be mad at yourself at least. It was just wasn't meant to be. But if it happens and you worked hard, it's even more satisfying. You also try to stay really involved with your community and you're wearing the shirt for it right now. You're from Flint, Michigan. Yeah. First of all, how crazy is it that they're still having a water crisis? Extremely, extremely crazy. And it's just crazy that the, the America's worried about other things right now when there's a, literally a city in Michigan that doesn't have access to clean water like it's a third world country. Does that make you angry? Yeah, it does. So how did you kind of come about Jug Life and why was it so important to you? Um, so I started Jug Life uh, as basically just a hashtag trying to influence people to drink more water. Um, I think it's like 80, 80 something percent of people in America don't get enough water that they actually need every day. And uh, obviously Flint, Michigan doesn't even have access to clean water. So that's even a crazy statistic if you think about it, just because we're in America, like the richest country in the world. Um, but I started just trying to get people to drink water, started posting on Instagram, me drinking a gallon a day, and people started doing it back. And then my uh, my business partner, Kez Reed, his uncle uh, is a philanthropist, but he travels around the world and just does like missions. So he goes to the Philippines, helps out, blah, blah. So he was in Uganda and he contacted Kez and was like, there's opportunity to build water wells out here um, because they have no access to clean water. It was a, it was a couple schools, um, students who were HIV infected and they the villages weren't letting them come to their water source just because they were afraid, I guess. So we found that opportunity and we were like, this is a great opportunity to help. And then that's what started the foundation part of Jug Life and we've been doing it ever since. In the past two years, I actually got to go to Uganda and see the natural water sources that they were drinking out of, which were cloudy white with 
infections and things like that, they wash up in there. The animals use the bathroom in there. Guys are cleaning their bikes in there. Like it's, and then kids come with 20 gallon jugs and fill it, fill up the dirty water and bring it to their villages, basically just spreading disease. So just being able to help out with that was definitely one of the best things I feel, feel like I've done. Including basketball? Including basketball. So the JaVale McGee that you are now is not always who you were when you first started in the league, basketball-wise. Um, you struggled a bit in the beginning, and the media criticized you quite a bit. How much did that affect you? Um, I feel like it didn't affect me at first. Uh, it just affected me. It started to affect me when GMs and NBA coaches started to believe the things that the media or even like social media was portraying me to be. So what was the worst thing that you were hearing that was said about you? Uh, I was hearing things like I'm dumb, um, a bad basketball player, low IQ, uh, I'm an idiot. It's just, a, it's a lot of things that, but I'm not the person that's like reading comments like, oh my God, I can't believe this because I really don't care. It's when a GM or owner of a team starts thinking that and they're like, no, we don't want to sign them because that's now uh, affecting my livelihood and how I pay my bills and how I feed my family. So that's when I was just like, it's last straw. Like, I don't, because I'm not really the person who's going back on people on Twitter. Like, right. Because those are people I don't know and never will meet. So when you say it was the last straw, what'd you do? Um, I mean, it was definitely just low lights being shown to me on TV. Uh, but it had came to the point where I was like missing a layup. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is on the show now. And I'm just like, come on, man, everybody misses a layup, like a contested layup, like, come on, man. And I had to do what I had to do, and then it was canceled, and then I never was on a certain show again. You're talking about Shaq? Mm-hmm. Have you guys ever resolved that? No, but it's not really uh, something to resolve. I mean, he's in his own world, I'm in my own world, so it's not really a... It's not really a beef, like when I see you, it's smoke type stuff. So. Finally, Chris Broussard joins Nick and CeCe again to break down the Celtics' crucial win over the Warriors. Star, this Warriors team has a number of nights like they had last night, maybe not as bad, and we just keep saying, okay, they had it, they'll be fine. It's right. the Warriors. They're fine, no worries, they're fine. But I don't know, Steve Curry made a few comments there that they have a couple things that they do need to address and they do need to correct. Are you buying that the Warriors have actual flaws on this team? Well, it's, actually, it's funny because, Steph, you, you saw that underlying smile and smirk. Well, where he's, smirk not, he's not too concerned, I don't think. That's my point. I'm not concerned. They're still the heavy favorite, my pick. It, there's a reason only three teams have three-peated in the last 52 years, Jordan's Bulls twice mm -hmm. and Shaq, Kobe, Lakers, because it's difficult. It's a mental drain to play these regular season games when you know it's all about May and June, even June for you. And there's a reason no team's been to five straight finals right. since Russell Celtics. LeBron right. went to eight straight, but he got different teams. Different teams. So we were talking about Steph, Clay, Draymond, Iggy. Try, I know Durant's new, yeah. but those four guys trying to do this for a fifth straight 100 game it's season. Challenge. If you look at Jordan's Bulls, the two that three-peated, the third season, their regular season record was always the worst. Mm -hmm. So it, it happens. That said, they do have – there are some concerns I have about this team. I think this is the most vulnerable they've been since Kevin Durant got there. And here's a few things. Boogie. Now, when you look at DeMarcus Cousins, the eye test – He's running the floor. He's sharing the ball. He's moving okay for him. It looks fine with the eye test. And when you look at the conventional numbers, 15 points, eight rebounds, a team high in 25 minutes, you think, okay, Boogie's fitting in. You look deeper into the numbers. Defensively, when Boogie is on the floor, mm -hmm. they are one of the worst teams in the league. Their, their defensive rating is like 107.7. Mm -hmm. that's, that's mediocre. When he's – I'm sorry, 108.6. Yeah, which is even worse. Right. When he's not on the floor, their defensive rating is better. Offensively, when he's not on the floor, they play at a historic level offensively. And when he's there, they're more like a mediocre team. Their net rating is nine points better when he's well, off the floor. And it goes deeper than that. So when they're all NBA – lineups out there all that five started, guys five that start mm -hmm. they are the clay kd steph boogie and draymond they have a negative net rating they're being outscored by their opponents when those five are out there when the four are out there without boogie, without boogie 
They're beating opponents by 12 points for 100 possessions. That's a problem. It's a, That's Kerr a problem. Kerr is going to have to make the tough decision because you know they see it. You know they have these numbers. Look, before Boogie got there, you Steph was the only weak link defensively. And teams would try to target him, get him in pick and roll, but you could protect him. Now you have two guys you can go at if you're in offense mm-hmm. in Boogie and Steph, and that's made them vulnerable. The, the one thing that was a calming force for me, that guy doing the interview. Man. Right. I mean, I've been, I'm I've been watching guys complain, <laughs> make excuses. Man, I hate this. Man, I, the media, y'all did this to me. Steph Curry, bro, he's the calming force to in the NBA right now. KD is unstoppable. He is a matchup nightmare. But Steph Curry sat there like a grown man right. in his uniform. The leader. Yes. The way you want your leader to be able to talk because ultimately he can't make excuses. And he said it in these last 16 years. We're going to have to show some people because this is new to them too, having Boogie. Now, these guys have made all these sacrifices, sacrifices, and sacrifices. Nick, you mentioned something to me last season when they were when everyone was upset about Boogie signing with the Golden State. He's like, they can't get better offensively. Right. It's impossible. Right. They they were they had the greatest <laughs> offense in NBA history last year. So like right. you you at some point you reach a point of diminishing returns. Like your offense is not going to be more efficient. So this was I the reason that the boogie acquisition in my eyes was a good one for them and a no-brainer was it removed the injury component to a degree. Last year when they went through this late season swoon, it was because Steph was out. There was time when KD yep. KD missed a little bit of time, Clay missed some and if you if during a playoff series you're missing one of those guys, well now then all of a sudden feed right. boogie. Last year we sat down and talked and we said, "Okay, how are they going to not Three P. Right. Like what would have to happen in the NBA? And Nick said, man, that's like an insurance policy. It's an in, it, it, and as an insurance policy, it might be a good one. But as an insurance policy that you're having to actively use when you don't actually need it yet, you're seeing the negative aspects of it. And so like that is because the point that was made to me that we talked about was if the offense can't get better and he's not going to help your defense, then how does he make you better? Yeah. It's not like he is some calming locker room force. But this isn't I, – I think your point on Steph is a very important one because we didn't play it, but KD's postgame interview couldn't have been more different. KD, the media asked him about uh, – Steve Kerr said we got to play with more anger. Right. And KD's like, oh, I thought we were based on joy. Because like, Kerr's been saying that all right. season. And, and <laughs> so, joy, right? And, and KD <laughs> is – Irritable. You know what I mean? Yeah. And KD didn't play well. They were without Clay. Right. KD didn't have a yeah. good game. Yeah. And and but the other concern for me is Boogie notwithstanding. Last year, people are gonna say, okay, last year they ripped off 10 of 11 and then they went on a three and seven stretch. But Steph wasn't there. Right. We haven't mm-hmm. seen this team not play well with Steph on the court. They won 16 of 17. Since then they're three and five. And Steph's been playing. Like, the, the invincible part of this team for four-plus years has been, do we have Steph, do we not have right. Steph? They won games without Durant. I understand Clay wasn't out mm-hmm. there last night and hurt their shooting, and it really hurt their defense. But it's odd to see them struggle when Steph's been healthy. If there's one thing that if I was to say I would be concerned about, that's their home record. I mean, their home record is not like any other team that we've seen. Right now, I think there's nine other teams in the league that have at least the same home record as them or a better home record than them. And they have been dominant. Oracle has been a special place. And this being the last year that they're going to play there, that would be something that I would be more concerned about, the number of losses they have at home. The other thing with, uh, with you mentioned Steph. Steph is like their Tim Duncan. I've been saying this for years mm, okay. since this, this run began with them. The different personalities, but Duncan set the tone in the whole organization. So when you came into the Spurs, everybody bought in because Duncan set that tone. It's the same thing with Steph. He brings that, like Kurt talks about, that joy. Steph, even though Draymond's been the inspirational leader, I guess, and all that, Steph has set the tone for that whole franchise. And Draymond is interesting, too. 
because we know he's always been one of the best defenders since this run began. His defense has steadily declined since 2015, and now it's at an all-time low for him. He's still a good defender, mm-hmm. but he's not and he's the been dealing defensive with a bad player. Toe injury. Yeah, his body is starting to break down Which a little bit on him. Which is a big and, concern for them when it comes to right. contract stuff. He just signed with Clutch, and I'm not saying because he wants to go play with LeBron because I don't right. think that's why. I think it's because they will hold he you to the to fire. Money. And if he was, in my mind, I know Kawhi won a couple of the Defensive Player of the Year awards. I think Draymond had a three-year stretch where he should have won all three. I thought Draymond was the best defender in the league, bar none. When he is just a very good defender, then his value proposition changes enormously right. because his shooting's at an all-time low because of these other mm-hmm. these other potential issues. Thank you for listening to the Hoops on Fox podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review letting us know what you think of the show.